University of Humanities and Education of the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine, Trinidad, Dean Dr. Heather Cato, welcomes you to the symposium, Dreadness, the Mystic Power, Philosophy and Performance of Shadow, Winston Bailey. My name is Jessel Murray, Deputy Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Education, and it is my privilege to welcome you on behalf of Dean Cato to our symposium today. Three panel presentations throughout the day, a convoi and a celebratory Dingole dance party. We are excited to start today after a riveting opening evening yesterday, which featured a keynote address by Rayshon Peer and performances of the music of Shadow. So how did Dreadness start? During bi-monthly virtual listening sessions among friends led, lie, led by Dr. Susan Burke, the head of the Department of Literary, Cultural and Communication Studies of the faculty, colleagues discerned that the commemoration of Shadow's 80th birthday in 2021 had passed seemingly almost unnoticed. Out of these discussions, the idea for dreadness was born and has evolved into our symposium. To whet our appetite for the day's proceedings, let us now turn to a video exploring the man and his artistry. The voice of the people is the voice of God, but now I go in there and anything could happen. But the thing, the hard work happened already. We're talking about one performance. After all the hard work, the nights and the days and the thing I'm putting it together, that's the thing I want to see today. When they eliminate this thing and just watch it when they have and say, you are, and you just be. <laughs> So I was having a little story about Shadow. <laughs> you know, somebody asked Shadow, uh, the two Shadow, the story goes that there was this arranger, producer, who said that he was responsible for Shadow. And Shadow laughed, you know, and he said, well, he had to be stupid. Why he didn't make more Shadow? <laughs> Of a Calypsonian shadow is analogous to, to the griot, right? The griot, of course, some um, um, from the, that oral tradition of West West Africa. Okay, so for example, the Igbo people of, of Nigeria, you find that the griot um, is usually male, even though you do have um, female griots, and the griot um, serves multiple roles. Poverty is I see Shadow as one of the only, if not the only Calypsonian that his, his lyrics, his, his movement expresses his lyrics. And I think it's because it's so earthy, that's why the movement expresses his lyrics. You know, when you look, when you listen to some of it, you have to listen to the words, right? Like, um, I love music. And when he starts with I love music, the first thing that you see is that open expression of the body. I love music, plenty music, 
I love party, endless party, and when the music tight, 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 and I can do all right, and I'm having fun, let the music play on. I remember vividly, because um, I went to school in Port of Spain, right? I went to, I went to Rosary Boys. And I used to, um, in those days, it wasn't TSTP yet or even BMO, it was Teleco. And my mother used to work there. And so I used to leave Rosary and walk down to my mother's office when school was over. Which I was like a two minute walk. And one day I was walking down Henry Street and I'm seeing, this is in the middle of the day, I am seeing this man coming up the road, this black hat black waistcoat type suit billowing um kind of you know neo like trench coat before there was even neo and it was like listen and of course in my little eight year old mind this this is a superhero what is this going on here and i'm looking absolutely in awe of this and 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 of course in that time it was almost like he's floating and that is the kind of mysticism and magic that shadow had and 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 kind of cemented with his look. So I think on the music scene, everybody would know that he carved a niche that was unique. I was planning to forget Calypso, to go and plant peace in Tobago, but I am afraid, I can't make it great. Every night I lie down in my bed, I hear in a bass man in my head. Bump, 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 Well, I hope your appetites have been whetted for the day ahead. Three presentations to follow very shortly, a convoi and our Dingole dance party. Welcome everyone to our dear presentations to our symposium on shadow. I'd like to welcome Dr. Teresa Granger, musicologist and lecturer in cultural studies at the Department of Literary, Cultural and Communication Studies at the Faculty of Humanities and Education, who will chair our first panel of the day. Dr. Granger. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first panel of our second day of Dreadness, the mystic power, philosophy, and performance of shadow. Departing from the music it, in this first panel entitled The Music Jumbi, Ancestral Groundations in Music and Message, we will have presentations by John Arnold, Martin Raymond, and a dual presentation by Deborah Matthews and Yvonne Weber. We start with a paper entitled The Unique Musical Aesthetic of the Dread Music Jumbi Shadow, a musical analysis of the music of the shadow by John Arnold, who is a recording artist, musician, founder, and director of Signal Hill Alumni Choir, and is currently a PhD candidate in cultural studies at the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine. Through music analysis, this paper examines compositions that speak to Jambi's hell and folklore. It considers the bass lines and the use of space herein. Through such analyses of Shadows' compositions, this paper explores how certain rhythmic, melodic, and harmonic patterns emerge to create that specific sound, shadow sound. We welcome John Arnold. Good morning, everyone. Good morning to the good morning to the organizers. Good morning to the panel. And uh, let me say this is a really great day as we explore the work of the Mighty Shadow, who was a very dear friend of mine. 
The Mighty Shadow was an unorthodox, unique, and mystical musician and composer. The broad range of his compositions is testimony to his musical genius. The dreadness and mystique of Shadow is rooted in the confidence he had in him being different. As far as Shadow was concerned, he had jambis that guided him in a completely different way to any other composer. Shadow got so used to people not understanding his music that his confidence grew stronger day by day. Several elements of Shadow's music gave it its compelling and Shadow West feel. Uh, just excuse me one second, let me just put on my PowerPoint. Yeah, several elements of Shadow's music gave it its compelling and Shadow West feel. There were no parallels. So far, the research identifies several characteristics for his unique sound and, and feel. Firstly, he brought the bass to the front of the music and used space, a lot of space in his bass lines and in his melodies. He also featured several accentuations and phrasings which were employed throughout, inclusive of simple chordal schemas, which were often accentuated by his propensity for scatting and living. But perhaps most importantly, Tobagonian folklore and musical influences, and this speaks to the tambourine, the tambourine music, um, jig and reel, and also the patterns of speech band, were all embedded in his music and of course his poetry. He used a particular combined style also in the instruments that accompanied him. He clearly had a penchant for hell and judgment associated with being there. By researching many of Shadow's songs, compositions, especially those on Jambi's hell folklore, certain patterns emerged um, that spoke to the rhythm, melody, and the harmonic contributions. Who is Shadow? Let's talk a little bit about who is Shadow. He was born in October, on October the 2nd, 1941 in Belmont. However, he spent his early life in Tobago in a village called Lekoto. Everyone knows Lekoto is well known for folk tales and superstitions even to this day. Therefore, the influence of those things must have been inevitable. The Tobago Jambi was a part of his life. Jambi is a real legend and affects all of us as it describes, as it is described as rampant souls who lead us right or wrong. Against this background, the dreadness and shadows offering is manifested in many songs. The whole notion of fear, apprehension, uncertainty was all part of Shadow's aura. The Jambi, according to France, is a mischievous, mythical, ghost-like creature known for possession and other physical disturbances in the Caribbean. Thought to be the souls of someone who has lived a violent life or died a violent death, practices such as exorcisms and prayer are performed in hopes of capturing and banishing these presents from their victims' lives. The Jambi goal is not to harm or kill, but just to cause mischief and mayhem. That's according to France. Another good comment from Erickson Bernard he says that Shadow confessed to him that he moved the music from the front, the horns, to the back, to the rhythm. Winston Gypsy Peter says that Shadow had this unique ability to tell the most complex story with using minimal words. And those words 
even international audience can relate to it. Debbie Jacob, I think, expresses this fine comment. His music is famous for its bold bass line and its strange offbeat stories. A bass man from hell who comes out to play. A jabless exposing her cow foot to a horrified victim. Abbasina the devil, the most frightening blue devil masquerader ever to demand money from spectators. But I think Booker Rennie sums it up greatly about shadow. The world never readily embraces the difference. The world strives relentlessly to smother the intrinsic challenge in nature of the different so that phenomena are restrained at a level of acceptable comfort zones. Book already. Jerry, Jeremy Montego of the University of Oxford defines music as a sound that conveys emotion. Shadow understood this only too well. There's always a debate when we analyze music because music affects people involuntarily and of course subliminally. Some argue that people do not have the technical expertise or basic understanding to judge music. There's a severe subliminal effect of music on persons as they listen to it. However, several analytical tools have been developed to analyze and evaluate music. Cook says an analyst will adopt one method and ignore or denigrate the other. So that we have today the motivic analyst, the Skenkarian analyst, the semiotic analyst, and so forth. Cook further argues that an analyst sometimes get more concerned with the validity of the analytical method rather than the purpose of illuminating the music. In looking at some of the theories, before I come to tell you what I combine as my analysis, some of the early theories, of course, focused on scales, chords, forms, EMB, instrumentation, and looked at, of course, melody, harmony, and rhythm. I will delve a little further into that shortly. Cook makes a great point when he says, sometimes they emphasize the traditional forms because they believe that people's responses to music were largely conditioned by the past. People derived aesthetic pleasure from the music because the musical form developed in accordance with their own expectations. However, he further argues that people can also derive pleasure from the opposite, with the music being unpredictable and not doing what the listener expected. We will all agree that the main focus there is expectation. I agree with Cook on the notion that music as it appears to the listener and music as it appears to the analyst may not necessarily be the same thing. So just to touch a bit on some of the, the theorists, Skenkarian analysis, um, he looks basically at the, the triadic nature of compositions along with the use of arpeggios, auxiliary and passing notes. This format did not look at extended harmonies of nines and thirteenths and complex harmonies. Of course, we have the idea of the traditional form of A and B, where you have a verse, chorus, sometimes a bridge, the C. And of course, we have the semiotic where a piece of music is chopped into units possessing some degree of significance within the piece. And these are analyzed um, by a way of distributing them throughout the piece. The idea of how the music and how 
we take the musical structures and the embodiment in those particular um, pieces, how that comes across and what it means in terms of the names we give to them in terms of the chord, chord names and the symbols. The songs that I'm going to be talking about in this short presentation, um, and we can't obviously go through all, um, Obia, Sukunia, Jump, Judges Jump, Jumbies, Jumbie Rhythm, Fire Down Day, Baseman, Gomangala, Wap Koki, King from Hell, Pay the Devil. As you can see, all these songs spoke either had the use of folklore or spoke to hell, spoke to death, spoke to revenge, and spoke to jumbies. Shadows, chordal schemas, as I said earlier, were always simple. Very few chords in some cases, and in some cases, um, not too complex, um, very tragic. Um, songs like Sukhanya was just basically two chords, um, we had other songs where um, Obia was basically two chords in the A form and then went to something like four. But of course, these songs can all be um, rearranged and given some more chordal harmonic structure. Um, when I looked at this music, I saw that if you compare it to rock and pop, it's basically the same simplicity in terms of what they do in using the chords. His melodic contributions were also using melodic contours, which varied depending on which songs he had, some going up, some coming down, some stay like poverty is hell in a kind of line. Um, so you would see that the melodic contours differed. Um, in his early life in the 70s, he sang in a, in, in, in a much more higher tone or pitch, a higher tenor voice. And later on, we saw where his voice came down to um, more like, um, I would say, tenor baritone, um, somewhere in that region. Shadow was always emph emphasizing the use of rhythm. I recall being in Toronto managing, managing him on one occasion, and he got in like 12 o'clock in the night and we had to go to a rehearsal for 1 a.m. out of town, out of Toronto. And after almost half an hour practicing with the band, um, he came outside and he told me, he said, John, the drummer is not getting the rhythm. I can't work with that. He has got to get the rhythm. And I had to come back in and tell the band that they have to listen to CD and get that. And I remember, we never got that until maybe two hours after because we got them like four o'clock in the morning. Deborah Jacob, I think really says something great here when she says, Shadow was always insistent on getting the rhythm right. Shadow gave Soka its heartbeat, deep bouncing bass lines that propelled the music forward in a mesmerizing rhythm that knew no boundaries. So I just want to touch a bit on those features that for me speak to shadow. The first one is the use of the bass. The bass had primary dominance in almost every single composition. The use of space. If you listen to, um, you're looking for horn. The bass are just three notes that just play and there's a long pause. But what it does for the song is just amazing as the other harmonic um, contributors really keep the music going, even with that shortened line on the bass. So you would see that in a number of his songs, when we play a few of those in a few minutes, um, the use of space. I thought that that was something he did very well. Again, a lot of heavy accents on whoop, whoop, kokie, you would hear the heavy accent, so much so that you can actually 
from what we call sound symbolism. You almost feel it from the music, the WAP, Kokie. Um, pay the devil also has good accents with pay the devil, pay the devil. Um, the chord progressions, as I said, were very simple. And again, the use of several of, of our folkloric um, patterns um, and the music. If you listen to Way Way Out, um, which is from the album Sweet Sweet Dreams, he used the fiddle, the violin, and he used the whole pattern of the jig and reel very, very strong in that song. That's a song. When you have some time, you should listen to it. It's actually on YouTube also, way, way out. Speech Man, of course, um, even in terms of its rhythmic pattern, was very pronounced in songs like Poverty is Hell, Sukhaniya, Gossiping, and so on. Use of plenty rhythm, so that even when he didn't have brass, he used, he focused on the rhythm. When it was for cost in talking to Shal and his son, there were sometimes he didn't have the, the funds necessary to do brass, so he would do synthesizers. But again, the rhythm was always key. If you listen to all Shadow's music, a significant amount of it also has the use of scatting, where he does these ad lib free up lines right through. That's it. Even live performances, he does it even more. And then the comping style of both the keyboard and the guitars, I thought were just um, something unique to what he did. I'm sorry, the original thing was if we had this live, I would actually display, show, showcase some of these on the piano. But the comping style was very unique and I think added to the sound of how Shadow's music came out. And then lastly, I the repetition. He used repetition a lot in his compositions. But for me, I thought that that was for real greater emphasis and for also making sure that it affects us in a certain way. I just want to play maybe two songs. I'm not too sure how much time I have. But, um, I want to just play Obia. This is not over here. Ooh, not getting it. Right. Um, can can everybody hear? Not too sure. Let's play, John. Okay. Maybe share your audio. Did you share your audio, John? Oh. Oh. So okay. stop share oh. and share audio. One sec. Wait.
right, so of course you heard that ad lib there. Um, and the next one I'd like to share is King from Hell. And this is from 1975, so you one um, of course you saw you heard the use of space there again strongly um, what cookie those 12 songs but if you were to go through them and talk through um and we had a, a way of showing you i wish i was on a piano sorry um that again just to close um the use of the bass a lot of space this is my own subjective self here the heavy accents and the punctuated phrasings um the simple chord progressions um, the use, and again, using a lot of folklore um, and all music from Tobago, a lot of rhythm, and then the opportunity to do a lot of scatting. And as I said, if you listen to it, keyboards and the guitar, have, they all use of this special kind of comping effect, and of course, a lot of repetition. Thank you very much. Thank you, John, for sharing your analysis of Shadow's work with us. We will now welcome Martin Raymond, who is Assistant Professor at the University of Trinidad and Tobago within the Digital Media Arts Program. He is a musician, record producer, and engineer who is responsible for shaping the final songs of Red Sound of many recent soca. His paper is titled Bringing Down the Rhythm, Shadow and the Rise of Speed Soca, which examines how ancestral traditions were connected to modern sensibilities by using technology. 
this paper shares Raymond's time working with Shadow at the Caribbean Sound Basin Record Studio in Trinidad and will detail Shadow's methodology and approach towards music technology, especially in his use of drum machines and synthesizers, as well as how Shadow conceived of the record, recording studio as an instrument in of itself. Warmest welcome to Martin Raymond. Hi, good morning all. Um, welcome and thanks for having me. All protocols observed. I want to tell you a story, and uh, this is a this is a true story, as all the best stories are. So this story takes place in the year two thousand. It was the dawning of the new millennium, and this was in Maraval in Port of Spain. Um, for those who don't know, Maraval is a call it a sort of upmarket suburb like that's north of Port of Spain. And this dawning of the new millennium, the air was as full of new possibilities. Uh, that was in the cafeteria of the futuristic Caribbean song based and recording studios. At the time, that was seen as one of the leading recording studios anywhere in the world. It was one of the few purpose-built recording studios done from the ground up at anywhere in the world, um, filled with all of the latest technology. So we were in the cafeteria, um, just hanging out, rhyming, talking, etc. And standing by himself was Winston Bailey, the shadow. Now the thing is, I don't ever recall seeing shadows sitting down in my experience. Maybe he did, but around me, to be shadow was always a, a looming figure, is always standing there, this huge frame, etc. So st shadow was standing there by himself, just staring off into the distance. Um, and suddenly, apropos of nothing, he didn't seem to be talking to anyone in particular. He just said, is the last days. Oh, sorry, I can't give, I can't imitate Shadow's voice, but you can just imagine hearing it in his voice. Is the last days. All of a sudden, all conversations stop. Everybody froze. Because on the few occasions that Shadow signed or deigned to speak, it was best to listen. Because usually serious business was afoot. Everyone turned to look at Shadow, and Shadow was still like staring off any distance and he frowned, and his face darkened. It's almost as if he was seeing the event horizon of coming events like too terrible to contemplate. And then he raised his voice. It's the last days I tell all you. And he turned around and started to look at, er at everyone. Um, and they're almost like daring people to challenge what he was seeing. So everyone was kind of looking at, at each other, wondering where, where was he coming from? And then a lone voice spoke up. This was a gentleman by the name of Mr. Pierce. He was the head of um, cassette duplication. He wasn't the least bit intimidated by Shadow's this carefully cultivated reputation of schizophrenic mis um, mystery. You know, Shadow was, because of the dark themes of his music, he was rumored to be a possible dabbler in the dark arts, etc. cetera. Um, but Pierce clearly wasn't intimidated by any of this. You have to remember, this was the guy who literally turned voices in his head, the bass man from hell, into a, a monstrous hit record that had forever changed music. So Mr. Pierce turned to Shadow and said, Winston, why are you so? What he asked you mean is the last days. And Shadow turned around, look, God sent a mealybug parasite to kill plants. At the time, there was a... Um, this mealybug parasite had been affecting the whole agricultural landscape of Trinidad. So people, we sort of nodded our heads in agreement, etc. Then Shadow kept staring at the, at the whole audience. He had us in the audience now. Then he just spoke a single word, AIDS. And that word hung like a death sentence in that morning air. Everyone started, we all got nervous, wondering what is Shadow talking about? Then Shadow said, God sent AIDS to kill man. Bit by bit, we, we, th we thought we started to understand. We started to see where Shadow was going, where Shadow was going with this. 
or so we thought. And then Shadu fixed his gaze on Sheldon Shellshock Benjamin, this one man musical revolution who was changing the whole course of soca music. And staring straight at Shellshock, Shadu said, and God sent little boys with drum machines to kill music. And he stormed out. Though from, from that, one could be mistaken in thinking that um, one could be mistaken in thinking that um, Shadow was anti anti technology, but that that was not really the case. Um, let me let me explain a little bit further. So shortly after that, and let's put this up on the let's put this up on the screen here. So. Uh, Shadow said it, it was the last days, and that theme was very much in the air, the turn of the new millennium. A bit later on, around that same period when I had the opportunity, I was working with Shadow at the time in Caribbean Song Basin, and I kind of pulled him aside and explained, you know, you know, what did he mean by that, this idea of, you know, God send little boys with drum machines to kill music. Um, and Shadow said, you know, I don't have anything against the the machines, you know, but they're using the thing wrong. And I asked him to explain what he meant. And this is what he said. It named drum machine. Hear those words, drum machine. So you could either treat it like a drum or you could treat it like a machine. And what he meant by that was this. As I asked him to explain further, he said, if you think of it as a drum, then you are playing it. But if you think of it as a machine, it will play you or it will dictate you know, where, you know, where, where it is to go. And this was, even though Shadow's music has always been, um, yeah, yeah, Shadow's, um, even though his music has always been rooted in these ancestral traditions. Um, he was always forward thinking. In fact, one could actually describe Shadow very much in the canon of an uh, Afrofuturist. I see Dr. Kayla Francis um, in the chat there mentioned an album I'm going to talk about called Way Way Out, which was an album that was probably way ahead of its time, a very synthesizer heavy album that Shadow did in, in the 80s that only started to get this recognition around 2015, 2016. And right now there are music collectors, particularly electronic music collectors in Europe that search for copies of that, that album and pay up to three, $400 for a copy of that album. That is how far Shadow was ahead of the time. Um, and so as part of this discussion, one of the concerns Shadow had with drum machines is that he felt that the, this new generation of producers was letting the technology dictate them um, in terms of particularly in terms of the increase in tempo of the music. Though to understand something, I would I would say that Shadow most definitely defined the sound of modern soca. Um, Shadow it is up tempo music starting from bassman. I come out to play. Um, um, chef your carcass, all these kind of things. Shadow from the mid 70s, one could say Shadow set the tempo of Carnival. And in the 1980s, when we saw the rise of the big FET, um, thanks to changes in technology with massive song systems, etc., and bands such as Chandelier, Firefight, Song Revolution, Shadow's music dominated the FETs in a way um, that almost no other artist did. And it was he had the formula, the type of drum beats, the emphasis on the bass, the space in the music, the groove in the, groove in the music. Um, and in fact, many Calypsonians used to come to the Fets just to see what was happening, to try to understand what was happening. But Shadow had the, the pulse, the pulse of the people in terms of this new form of music, this new structure of music. And he instinctively realized for his music to work in that arena it had to, the structure had to change. The structure had to change, the feel had to change, the vibe had to be changed. So, uh, so Shadow was not against up-tempo music or anything like that, but what he started to see happening was thanks to the technology, particularly technology of the drum machine, 
where you could easily just type in a tempo and press play. The music had started to get faster and faster in a way um, that was now losing the human feel and the human touch. In fact, just shortly before that, that um, story I told you for the, the couple of years running, um, one of the singers originally signed to Caribbean sound base, Ajala, had been having hits and increasing the tempo of the music. Um, so both person like Super Blue, Preacher, Ajala, right through the 90s, soca music started getting faster and faster and faster. And Ajala had come on the scene with uh, um, at least this new era of Ajala with a song called Jump Up and Get On Bad, followed by things like Jump and Mash Up the Party. And then somewhere in the 90s, he had something called Horsey, which at the time was acknowledged as perhaps one of the fastest songs ever recorded. In fact, I have a memory of a Carnival Tuesday evening, literally running behind a truck out of breath, trying to keep up with the pace of this song. And, but in 1999, Ajala did something unexpected. He came out with a song that was a, a slow groove type of song. I just want to play a little piece of it. But this song was entirely based on a conversation he had with Shadow where Shadow stopped him in a corridor at Caribbean song base and said, what you doing, boy? Um, you know, all, you're, all you're interfering with the thing. Mm -hmm. um, you, know, you have me like a racehorse on the track. You know, where, where are you going at all that speed? And as Shadow explained, you know, speed is nothing without, without groove. Music, the music has to groove. So this song, I was going to play a, a piece of it with uh, Jala's um, permission. Um, it's also one of the few times um, someone did a, a, a almost no perfect imitation for Shadow with, with Shadow's blessings. And uh, the lyrics in this song, I said, is almost word for word what Shadow told Ajala at that point in time. In order to hear this sound, you must turn your base to come see. Down, down, down. I'm tired of the running and the running. Bring down the redeem. I'm tired of the running and the running. So, so that yeah, so that that song was I say directly in directly inspired by Shadow. And the curious thing about it, well, not really curious, is perhaps due to the um, habit of um, DJs in Trinidad not identifying um, the name of the song or the name of the artist. Many persons thought that was Shadow when that song first came out. Persons flocked to the record stores asking for Shadow's new song, asking for Shadow's new album. And it was actually a couple of weeks before people understood it was Ajala doing a tribute to, to, to Shadow. And I, I spoke to Ajala, I spoke to Ajala um, recently this week about, about that. And what he was what he was saying is two things. The more it was, this is what Shadow tried to explain, explain to him that by by allowing yourself to be a slave to technology, to letting the drum machine dictate the pace, to speed up music just because you can speed it up, you're losing the essence of the thing. Though also, um, um, 
Shadow wasn't exactly too pleased with that with that with that tribute. As uh, those who knew Shadow, um, he was very protective over his image, his music, his his uniqueness, his his style. But however, he had a very close working relationship with Ajala. Ajala used to do a lot of his backing vocals, etc. So what Ajala, Ajala did when he recorded the song, he made sure to go by Shadow and play it to Shadow first. And I just want to tell you a, a second story. So. I discussed this with Ajala this week. So as soon as the song was finished, Ajala set out on a mission to find Shadow, to make sure Shadow heard this from him first before he heard it anywhere else. And he eventually found Shadow in a betting shop somewhere on the Eastern Main Road. And Shadow was lining with Lord Blakey at the time. Lord Blakey was still alive. So Ajala told him, look, I've done this, I've done this um, tribute song for you. You know, come and come and take a listen. So he carried both of them in in his car and played the song for them. Which point Blakey turned around and said, "Well, I thought you were playing one of your new songs. You know, why are you playing Shadow's new song?" At, at which point Shadow said, "You see, um, the boy is songing like me, and if he could song like me, he could song like you, Blakey. So you better you better watch yourself." Um, but. So Shadow sort of gave it his, its blessing in, in in his in his own way. Now another thing at that at that time and that that song really helped us spark uh, a, a whole a whole conversation over this idea of fast soca and speed soca. Now I'm using those terms very deliberately. So speed soca was Shadow's term for it, and back then we used to refer to either as fast soca, but Shadow used to use the term speed soca. And it was around that time I had a disagreement with William Monroe of the organizer of Soka Monarch. Um, Mr. Monroe may not remember this. I, was, I wasn't a, a major player at the time, but we had a conversation at Caribbean Song Basin. And at the time, uh, from a marketing point of view, um, William Monroe had decided to use the term power soca to refer to fast soca or speed soca and groovy soca, when I was to make this distinction between two styles of, 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 soca, of soca music. Um, and I myself was already, um, as many persons would know, I, I don't make much of a distinction, if any, between calypso and soca music. Soca music is as a form of calypso music for me. So for me to make this distinction between power and groovy was further dividing the thing. And Shadow sort of agreed with that. And at the time I remember telling someone who in the presence of Shadow that why I disagreed with the term power soca was at that point in time, one of the most powerful pieces of soca music I had ever heard in my life was Shadow's Poverty is Hell, which is dead slow. But that song had a force, a power. Um, um, the beat hit you in a particular kind of way. It grabbed, it grabbed your attention. And my argument was that speed doesn't define power. Power is something inherent in inherent in, in the music. And, and to this day, I'm, um, I'm still not too happy with the use of that term power soca, just meaning, just meaning fast soca, because as I said, you can get power in other ways. Now at this point in time, Shadow, Shadow was um, working with what I would describe his own two-man army which was just two persons. When he went in the studio, there were just two persons. Uh, Ronnie Sylvester, the son of Ray Sylvester, on the drum machine. The Shadow had his own drum machine, but Ronnie Sylvester was the programmer of his drum machine. And an older gentleman whose name I don't recall, uh, might be Fitzroy or something like that. It wasn't Pharrell, but um, Fitzroy, who was this keyboard player that had an array of synthesizers, etc. Um, so those were the two people Shadow was working with in, in the studio. And then one day in Caribbean Sound Basin, um, Shadow decided to show me, we were still having this talk about drum machines and, and synthesizer. And, and Shadow decided to, to show me something. As he says, one of the powers of yeah, Fitz Mellow Thomas, thank you very much. I've been trying to remember that, that name for, for quite, some, quite some time. So um, Shadow was saying one of the powers of drum machines, that one of the things that enabled him to do is something that he had always been trying to do that people didn't understand what he was trying to do. And what he did, he had Ronnie program a beat, a beat on the drum machine. 
Uh, he dictated him where he wanted the drums and right away you heard that distinctive shadow groove. So that rhythm and that groove was inside there, inside there with shadow. So shadow too, they said, it's song and good, eh? it's song and good. I said, yes, it's song and good. And then he picked up his guitar and he started to pluck some of the strings and he told Ronnie, okay, tune the bass drum to G, tune the snare drum to this, tune the tom tom to that. And he tuned each individual drum to a note on his guitar. And he said, right, listen to the beat again. And when he played that beat, all of a sudden it was just chalk and cheese. The whole, the whole place just exploded, the music just came alive. And he said, you know how many, you know how many years, you know how much fight I, I had in the studio with, with, with musicians telling them, tune the kick drum, tune the snare drum. It had to be in key with the music. And people arguing with me and telling me, well, the drum do have no note. But he said, but I, I know the power, the power in the music. So that, that was one of Shadow's, that was one of Shadow's secrets in the sense of what made his music, made his music so, so musical. And, and one, one final thing, when as a young person coming up, one of my favorite albums was Shadow's Dreadness album uh, from 1977, um, but a song called The Children Thing. And one of the things I loved about that song was one of the few calypsos I heard that had this Moog synthesizer bass all over it. And at that time in the 2000s, I had the opportunity to ask Shadow about it. And he told me, he said, he said that is me. I am the one that played that because he had this huge fight with, um, with uh, Dakota over the synthesizer. He wanted to use the synthesizer in his music, but uh, Dakota was like, no, no that's, not, that's, that's not for Calypso. So apparently Shadow, to art out of the studio and programmed the synthesizer himself and played all of those wonderful lines you hear, you hear on that, on that, on that thing. Uh, that's it for me. I, I, quite a few more shadow stories, but uh, I think we are, we're out of time at the moment, but I hope that gives you some insight into shadows thinking and his, his creative process. Thank you, Martin, for engaging us in an exploration of Shadow's use of technology, Afrofuturism, and their influence on Speed Soka. Our final paper for this first panel is by Deborah Matthews and Yvonne Weber, titled Abyssinia Coming Down, Rituals in Jumbi Time Spaces, which examines time space for story exchange between Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago, where a conversation which explores the conjunctures of dreadness that are lodged between the aftermath of colonialism, its ongoing socioeconomic and political inequities, and the narratives amplified by the shadow. Deborah Matthews is PhD candidate in cultural studies at the University of the West Indies St. In Augustine, who uses creative expression as a tool to cultivate conversations about resistance and kinesthetic memory. Yvonne Weber is also PhD candidate in cultural studies at the University of the West Indies St. In Augustine, working in various forms of theater in different cultural spaces with a focus on connecting performance with community. We welcome you both. Hi, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Let me start my screen share, sound right. Okay, off we go. Um, temporal rituals um, have to do with memory work. So it is only fitting that we begin this foray into dreadness with a memory. Um, I'm Trin Begonian, and as much as Shadow's music has been part of my life since my childhood, uh, my father was once a trumpeter in a calypso band. Every time I listen to his music, something new is revealed to me. Um, what you see on the left, I posted to Instagram just after Shadow's death in 2018. It's a memory of mine. I was 12 years old when the performance, a screenshot of what you see on the right, happened. Um, so this was 1994, um, the Calypso Monarch semi-final performance at Skinner Park in San Fernando, and Shadow declares to a TTT reporter, the voice of the people is the voice of God, but what I, I am going there, and anything could happen, but the hard work happened already. We're talking about one performance, after all the hard work, 
the nights and the days taking the thing and putting it together. I want to see a day when we, they eliminate this thing and watch the thing. And when it happens and say, you are and you just be. So today, my partner Yvonne and I want to propose that this thing is dreadness and it includes message, magic, and mystery. And we propose that dreadness is not the only way through what we're calling the shitstorm. Um, it, also, it is also the only way to see the shitstorm for what it is, um, to understand it, and most importantly, to survive it. So we approach the thesis of this paper um, in progress <laughs> from dual po um, positionalities, that of Jamaica, and um, through dub poetry of Mikey Smith and Kaiso of Trinidad and Tobago through Shadow, the mask of Winston Bailey. So we're asking the question, in what ways do Mikey Smith and Shadow use their positionalities to ground dreadness, thus laying bare the shitstorm? So uh, when we say positionalities, we're not only talking about place as in Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago, but we're talking about performance as in dub poetry performance and Kaiso man as performer. And also we're not interpreting in the sense of explaining, but more in the sense of voicing and speaking in tongues. Yvonne? Uh, good morning, everyone. I'd like, first of all, to acknowledge that I'm speaking from the lands of the Gumbari and Nunawal peoples, and I acknowledge their ancestors and their elders emerging and present. I'm Jamaica, and I had not heard of Shadow really till I came to live in Trinidad. Yet I knew Sparrow and 70s, I knew of Sparrow who would on occasion speak truth to power. And so I asked a Trini friend of mine, who is a serious pan man and Calypsonian, I mean, you know, that is his life, how he understood Sparrow and Shadow. And how, how, you know, not which one was better or which one was worse, but how, how he understood them. And he said to me, Shadow was unique. He could take a current affair and put it over from my grandmother's point of view. Sparrow, international. Shadow, local. And that is the industry that makes Shadow, Mikey Spitt, Bob Marley, Tosh, available for consumption outside of their place. But for Mikey Smith, that kind of exposure almost didn't come until after he was gone, you know, taken in that dreadful thing that happened when he was stoned today. For the purpose of this paper, we are as the order of things dictated by capitalism, colonialism, oppressive elements that only reward you if you don't struggle against them. The popularity of the dub, the dub movement in Jamaica, is most often associated with Oku Onura. It is his definition of dub poetry, articulated in 1979, that is the quintessential explanation. He says, it is a poem that has a built-in reggae rhythm. Hence, when the poem is read without any backing, one can distinctly hear the reggae rhythm coming out in the poem. This notion of rhythm coming out in the poem complicates the textualizing of morality because then the act is not simply to write words, but to write words that produce rhythm. This is, of course, coming out of speech, music, and the rhythm of Rastafari, melded into songs manipulated by selectors. On the other hand, Calypso is a distinctive musical form that holds special significance as a powerful embodiment of performance, as an act of communication. It's a music of the masses recognized as a lower class Creole occupation and bound up with the reaction of awareness and total response to the masses of the crippling condition of their life and in their society. 
and something that is certainly familiar to Jamaicans. A good collection is either the lyric Sakomani or the that it stands on its own in the latter in the latter case lyrics are only intended to beautify the tune where dub poetry poems are heavy with testimony warning and prophecy so too are calypsos especially from the 70s some of which have even incorporated reggae rhythm and themes and then we have rapso which is so close to dog poetry, we're going to leave that for another day. Debbie? Uh, both these forms be commentary on dreadness from both uh, the Jamaican standpoint uh, of dread talk and prophesite, uh, where dread takes the sense of the power of the shitstem to rule by fear or force. So there's dread in the righteous dread, dread, power that comes from being part of the circuit of nature of those here and those gone before. This has the power to rebuke the fear that the Shitstam wants to inspire, but it is not enough self-protection from the Shitstam. So from the TNT standpoint, the dreadness, rubber talk, signifying, signifying as in bad journalism, um, heroic self-aggrandizement is um, retaliative. It's avenging power, uh, fueled by justice and warns you first, and then it takes an eye for an eye. You could hear Abyssinia before you saw him. Mama, I hear a rumble. Abyssinia coming down and the pack, 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 pack of the biscuit tin drums, the screams of the imps and the sound of the dragging chains. Herald is coming. And Shadow warns you plainly, and we hear this in Dread Wizard, do trouble trouble or trouble go deal with you. He says, so if you bust my face, I go bust your face. And if you make me cry, go and learn to fly because I dread. Real dread. I am the wizard who was born dread. And he issues this warning and he postures in performance with a deadpan expression, all the more to impose upon the listener that this warning is not no pose and is not just talk. So why the devil mask? Uh, as the academic scholarship of Percy Prokop Crowley, Liverpool, Elder, and Regis, Tutbagai tell us. Uh, African masking traditions, mask making, and masquerading are found all over the continent of Africa. Um, and masking suggests spirit associated transformations where the wearer of the mask cancels his or her personality by changing into other human characters or supernatural spirits so that they're no longer themselves. Uh, Chalk Dust, Liverpool tells us in particular that by embodying spirits African maskers bring the mysterious world of nature and the supernatural into the known and more predictable community of humans so that the spirits may commune with the people and cause them to respond in various ways like dancing and drumming and praying and hand clapping and offering and singing. So the presence of jumbies is our connection to ancestral beliefs and interactions between planes, earth, and supernatural. So where others are possessed by jumbies, think, um, think Marshall, outer body, back to yourself now. Shadow communes with them, and he learns the thing from them and does their bidding where necessary. Herbert Nichols becomes a jumbie, Abyssinia, and using his already imposing six foot plus frame, he would go up on his toes and he would bear his ruku stained mouth dragged through the streets by chains, but to, to what end? Um, capitalizing on dread and fear to become gatekeeper. Yvonne? Now, Barry Shivans tells us that we can hear in music of Rasta, which has had a great influence on Mikey's uh, work. Now, revival swept through Jamaica and parts of the Caribbean and brought us the Baptist Warners among Warner Baptists among others. And Bedward, who was the founder and the most well-known preacher, saw himself as Aaron 
and Marcus Garvey as Moses. So you can see uh, where that connection to our beginnings is. But for the revivalists, communication with God, or properly speaking in the spirit, takes place through direct possession, in the course of which secrets are revealed and the possessed speak with the authority of God. They become gods. For Rasta, God is man. God is in man, and man is in God. Things are natural. We are deal with we don't deal with superstition about God in a sky and doppy and such thing said an informant to Mr. Owen who wrote one of the first really serious books about Rasta dread but if Rasta don't deal with Jumbi or doppy there is a still need to be in the spirit to find the energy to combat the forces of evil you need the chanting the drumming and the chalice to be overtly political, to speak truth to power, is the connection and respect for I and I as indivisible. If that is the version of the spirit in Rasta, where all of this then, would there be a meeting between Smith and whose rhythmic forms come from Rasta? And what would be his point of contact with Shadow? where the jumbies are so in your face. In asking this, I also needed to bear in mind that even if I did, or when I found such a point, it was not to say shadow equals Mikey Smith or Mikey Smith equals shadow. But Besson and Chevan point out that the I and I in Rasta is the transformation of possession. This is a core presence which is a, a communing a communication and it's one of the many manifestations of spirit in this smith himself also said i'm not trying to push rasta but i feel in its righteous dread i'm dreading a lox fire in my bone revolution in my head and a well dread so when lincoln crazy johnson says my he was more an anarchist than a rasta i said cool because I think of anarchy as the spirit unbound, directing the body to refuse to be bound. Mikey is channeling the energy. Direct, write yourself. Give me a little dog news. Give me a little dog music, write yourself tonight. Little dub music, right? Yes, so tonight I have this haunted feeling. So make we batting and catch a reason. Nobody talk about anything to me. Here it is. Skip the Oops. Would you all stop that you out a lot? I look to walk and make a seat up. We no mourners, we not go watch yourself go down the road like bittering flowers and just Give me a little dub music right just so tonight Give me a little dub music right just so tonight Far we search, we head down, we heart Down to we're very soul. Okay. Why is this happening? Sorry. <laughs> because Michael have a thing to say and you're going to say. So <laughs> here it is in the haunted feeling. The doppy, the jombie, leading the poet performer to a reasoning, a conversation. Such a shadow might have with his audience. Messages from the other side. Messages about the shit scene. So, Maybe. Jabba's warning. You pay the devil. If you do pay, you do pass. And you do pass clean, right? You have Jabba's threat. I go dot to you. I will make you into something else. You have Jab as gatekeeper. My power is that I allow you to pass. And when you pass, you will not be the same as you were before. You're either scared, you're relieved that you get away, you're dirty, you're clean, 
you are not the same. So shadows dread lens ting, right? Um, it's judgment of himself, as in Jumbies bring judgment to Winston. Like we see that in the song Jumbies, right? Um, revelation of this shitstem, uh, shitstem being injustice to the poor and to himself in competition. Um, the self becomes judge and gatekeeper, just like Abyssinia, right? And we see that in Pay the Devil. And then judgment of the evildoers and evildoers are the judges in Jump, Judges Jump, um, the angels in Poverty Must Hell, right? And these persons must all suffer for their wrongdoings. And how do they accomplish this? If dreadness is the lens, if it is the tool, then storying is the medium. Storying carries the tool and wields it where it needs to be wielded. Storytelling has always been a means of grounding to root and through this so-called rooting to liberate. It is a means by which you can make sense of the world while simultaneously critiquing it, leaving the listener to decide, perhaps siding with you if you craft your story just right, on which side judgment should be directed and upon whom. Yvonne? Yes. Yeah. So, Mikey had perhaps not so much judgment of self as prescience about how he would go, his end. I shall not die a natural death, but and in it I come, he says, it's going to take you, not only, but it's going to take I, but it take for you to this is a message that's going to consume the warner and the ward. He also had a revelation about the shit stem. But listening to a big man being called a boy and being asked if he can clean up the shit. When I hear the people them outcry and realize say, that the fight of capital is a contribution to this When the supermarket shelves were becoming increasingly bare as capital went north in fear of socialism. And thirdly, a judgment of the evildoers. Like you catch up on newspaper near a ship, a public toilet and a man dozing with jeez water that you use for cleaning your floor and your toilet and other things. So you might imagine what is in it. And my kid take out a pick and the man is circling blood. And I let him go, sit down and laugh, but look upon you to rass. And it's the laugh, not even in the ice pick or the circling with the red that you can hear the possessed pulling back. So Mikey is a virtuous storyteller, well at home with Caribbean time and space devices. I and I alone, he uses a jumping rope rhyme, room for rent, apply within, and the lines, when I you run in, are transformed into, but as me go, cockroach and rat and scorpion come in. And if you've ever jumped rope to that or any rhythm, it gets faster and faster. So the rhythm of it is taking the pressure, is relaying for us the pressure that people are feeling. And Mikey Smith talked to Mervyn Morris about how he crafted his music, or rather his poetry. And then we try to remember the rhythm, a whole under. And I catch my break and the, just like how a musician will work out. And music is also integral to Shadow's performance. It is a way to open the portal. In the letter, he uses the Caribbean device of a message which needs deciphering. I can't read it. Red, which is earthing in that driven to shake your soul. That's the message. And Shadow calls to sound to musicians, to what Carolyn Cooper calls the noises in the blood, to decipher it. 
And that is a song that Mikey Smith calls to in love. Both Shadow and Mikey are jarring, speaking in tongues. I have crossed an ocean. I have lost my tongue. I have this haunted feeling. I have lost my tongue, but out of the root of that comes new sound. A new sound has sprung, says Grace Nichols, who is from a line of long memory women. Gosh tells us that when a Calypsonian sings, that it reflects part of his being, his subjectivity and his experiences, derived from society and thereby making it part of the collective experience. So his experiences are however his own and part of his own life. Therefore, collective experiences are also personal, which I agree with, but I start moving away from where Gosh continues saying that a Calypsonian is chiefly an entertainer entertaining his listeners. And for me, that's not true. Um, as we know with Anansi, Anansi controls the stories um, and the stories control the world. But Anansi didn't win these from the sky god for nothing. Winston Bailey didn't sit down in silent rural places like Toko and Culloden listening to Jumbies only to release Shadow to come to town just to entertain. He came with a purpose. One. In names, there are stories. And depending on how the names were acquired, there can be indications of purpose. Shadow's name and Abyssinia's name work through and within time spaces where languages wrestle. Shadow in English is the shade, the spirit. That then to focus on the abyss as an unreadable darkness. Yet by going back, each name announces an entity entering into a performance space, a liminal space, a space will amplify the everyday. No man loses his shadow, very Walcott tells us, except in the night. And in the shadow is hidden, not lost. At the glow of sunrise, he stands on his own name in that light. And this is cyclical. It's a never ending cycle of creation and purposeful expulsion from self into space to open a way for Tutbagai through pandemonium to transcend, but to where and to what end. Interestingly enough, the song Pay, Pay the Devil, sorry, is a memory of a memory. Thanks to Kim Johnson, we know that Bailey was reminded while on tour in Barbados of this song. Uh, that he wrote in the 1970s and was admonished by some unnamed person that he had to bring it now and that the pack 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 rhythm had to come now and bring it he did he tells us of a memory from the perspective of a child of a man of which i will say this boldly but i hope that i'll be proven wrong right that there's no official photograph and there's no official record of his existence and it is only because of the diligence of Devon Adana, um, a young Tobago TikToker, she captured a video clip of her uncle. And it is because of this clip we know what an interaction with the mask Abyssinia was like. Um, nevertheless, this is the importance of capturing first person narratives. Yeah? Were it not for this video, were it not for Shadow's song, I would not have had a real understanding of how imposing of a man Nichols was as Abyssinia in order to make this comparison between his mask and that of Bailey's. Um, Dr. Granger, we have the eye on the timer, but I just, I need to play this clip. We almost done. Take off the two pieces in the middle. Mm -hmm. And you got to tape up them two there. Mm -hmm. like, so the four is this. You know how much so that is. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. right. So when he's here in town, yes. he's jabbing you with the fork yes. against yes. a wall. Yes. Uh -huh. you have to pay to and you have to pay to get relief. Yeah. So your neck in between the fork yeah. when yeah. Yeah. Because you got out to certain questions. Uh -huh. What trail that bring you down? Uh, well, if you know, 
you in trouble. Because he used to play with a little young lady named the dancer. And you could say, the tongue got been trained, bring it on. That's the name of the train that bring it. And with the damsel, if you know anything about the damsel, and if you know Mr. Swords, Mr. Swords was a gatekeeper. He had the thing on the way to work out. And he used to come and display the first before he go in tongue. Now, he mouth, take out the plate, and he will put him out. The mouth is only red. Fire on top, fire below. Because he had fire on top there. Right? Yes. And, he this, and he has fire in his tail. Mm -mm. And it's a long chain in between with. And when he come down the road, can he find it sometimes? Like, remember when I, and I start to jump around mm -hmm. and them things. And I was coming and you see the tongue. And next thing you see that. All you from my I was coming. And everybody had to run. And I said, I'm begins. You know me begins. He ain't doing begins on me. He go down the road there. So. And when begins, do expect it to turn back. That jabbing neck <laughs> against the wall. Six foot something to like oh yeah, 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 and that. Yeah, yeah, your old man height. Mm -hmm. And that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he played with, with pulling him out. Yeah. yeah. And then he had them telling yeah. me, I didn't want to like, when you meet them next, devil, you should take away them on you. Yeah, you shake your. But when you ask them what chain bring them down, yeah. like they can't say the tongues have been trained. What, what and if you know the damn zen, and if you know Mr. Swords, Mr. Swords, was it gatekeeper? You can't say all that. You were sharp with me coming back and I see Pina Malade, boy. I was paying the money and saw it in the back of it. Right here, so he neck. You had to pay. You had to pay. So this knowledge of the thing scared Winston, but it was craved by Shadow. He tells us in Jump Judges Jump that if he was bright, he would have learned the such a trippiness that shits him and its degreed agents wanted him to learn. And all he wanted to learn was how to make people jump and how to make them complicit in the action. And you saw in the Skinner Park performance, he says, wave something now, wave. And why? To use this action outside of his own ritualistic jump up on one spot in two main ways. His jump up. Take off the two pieces why in the middle. Yeah. His jump up. Ritual movement. The boys are the people. Next, right, leading to our jump up into release and forgetfulness from this earthly plane. But not everybody going to the same place. The jump up could lead you to judgment. And the same action, this jump up to the beat that portals the masses into liberation through pandemonium, in the same way that the devil mass was a justice mass. Not of the Christian God, again, thank you, Kim Johnson, but of an avenging African presence. And this same liberation jump up action for one set of people is a tool of torture and a way into judgment for those who did not judge Shadow's music fairly. To be fair, though, how do you judge something that you can't understand? I'm trying to have some maybe misguided sympathy for the judges that Shadow definitely did not have. But the people knew. And the voice of the people is the voice of God. So this is the bolstering of the remnants and reinjection of dignity that slavery and colonization sought to take out of human beings, their cultural expressions and their lives to invoke divine retribution on behalf of a people, not from the Christian God that enslaved them, but an avenging force, dark and terrible, but for oppressors. Yvonne, bring it home. This is the stepping razor that Mikey Smith was channeling channeling, who calls on the energy of judgment. For Jah knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. It's Old Testament righteousness, a spirit that will avenge. The tone of revivalism and Rasta, which transforms it, is not about the meekness of sections of the New Testament. It is about fierceness, Old Testament contending with and in the spirit, wrestling in and with its jumpy angel. But it matters that we pay attention to the fact that this portal that we're noticing and in what ways it is that this is a gendered manifestation, which is perhaps a time, a thing for another people. <laughs> and to end, thank you, Dr. Granger. To end, <laughs> we invoke the Jambia Stuart Hall, who we love. Uh, who defines identity in terms of dynamic production and uh, not a fixed product. 
if we can agree with him that cultural identity is a matter of becoming as well as being not so much a recovery of the past and a positioning by and within existing narratives, then we could understand the performative power of both dub poetry and Kaiso and appreciate their importance in forming one's worldview, bringing a reckoning or being made to reckon with Jumbies in temporal spaces. Thank you. Thank you both for this engaging approach to um, diasporic analysis of dreadness. So we have 30 minutes for Q&A and perhaps the panelists um, have questions or comments to connect the papers across um, so that they might have um, a kind of dialogue between themselves on some of the topics that arise before we open it up to the participants. Perhaps we can get everyone on screen, is that possible? Would anyone like to, to kick us off? As I say, I, um, so Jessel Murray had posted in the chat earlier and said he would like to hear a bit more about uh, Dakota's role in Shadow's music. Um, all the way up to um, really sometime in the late late 1980s and their relationship might have been a, could be described as a combative relationship but I think out of that tension kind of came all this great music because to understand at the time um, the arranger was king the arranger was god a Kalatunan didn't tell an arranger how to play the music or how to arrange the horns. In fact, Dakota was very famous. One thing I actually saw with my own eyes in a studio where a Kalatunan said, uh, well, I think, to which Dakota responded by pulling out a sheet of music, writing out something and saying, you could read that, you could read that. You don't think, I, I am the one in charge of the music. But Shadow had such a clear vision of his music, the lines he wanted, how he wanted things played, that they would often clash, but it was a very fruitful relationship. And I understand even on bass man, there was a big disagreement over the idea of notes, uh, should we have a bass line, what the horns were playing. But Shadow always ultimately, ultimately got his way. You know, and this way, he defined his music and not really the arrangers, but the Koto played a very, very important role in transforming Trinidad music from, from the 60s and shaping the sound of what we, we think of as Calypso and Soka music. Okay, so can I ask um, then when he calls for the musicians to read the letter, the music letter, is, he, is that genuine then given how clear his understanding of what he wants to say is? Or is that that there's something in what Job is telling him that he doesn't. Is he is he genuinely not clear, or is that a, a figure, a convention for the song? Um, I would say, and John could probably elaborate on this a bit more. Um, Shadow, he had a very clear idea of what he wanted musically, but in the calypso tradition, the artists are calypso and didn't tell the musicians what to play. Is yes, and they would play what they felt like playing, what the arranger said. So Shadow always had these battles in the studio with musicians that he wanted to play the horns in a particular way. He, had, he heard a very percussive kind of horn style, almost kind of like a funk kind of approach. And the horn players didn't want to play like that. In fact, Bassman was, uh, um, it, is, it is rumored that um, Bassman was the first time anyone had actually had to write a sheet with notes for the bass. So it was also kind of adversarial relationship, even getting drummers to play the type of beat he wanted. It's something Shadow described to me over and over that uh, one of the reasons he liked drum machines because an art decoder said the same thing is they don't talk back in the sand and they don't, they don't drink, they don't try to teeth your woman, they're always playing in time and they play what you tell them to play. 
Um, so we always had this relationship with, and that does the point of that song, Music Letter, because musicians weren't understanding his music. And they weren't letting him create the music he wanted to create. So in fact, he was being ironic there then. He's having a bit of <laughs> jab at them. Thank you. I think I just want to add to something. Um, Martin spoke when he talked about the Mealy Bug and the comment by Shadow. Um, Shadow. Shadow is suspicious of everything. Um, we were on a flight together and he said to me, you know, the cell phone, John, it took me long before I use it because something had to be wrong in the cosmic because how can a man sit here and talk to a man in China at the same time? And he asked me that. Of course, I could not answer Shadow because Shadow, that's how his mind works. You just have to let Shadow say what he wants to say. But here he was questioning how that is. Can you imagine me trying to tell Shadow it's possible? You just left. Um, so, he, yeah, there's so many strange things. He, he went to his grave. He had a gospel song he wanted to do, and he never got to do it. He never got around to it. So, um, yeah, but he was a genius, yeah. I also wanted to ask something about the um, poverty is hell. Um, because when I, I'm a Jamaican, and when I listened to that, I, <laughs> I had this conversation with Jimmy. I said, but I can hear the, the bingy beat in that. I can hear the... The rest of beaten now. I can hear a little bit of something like I would hear in, in a backing to Peter Tosh. And you are and correct. The... <laughs> okay. That's a fact. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, is I, that... I, yeah. I, Go I, ahead. I would say to me, Shadow's music definitely drew up all those influences of reggae, funk. He synthesized all those things, but it was rooted in back to the original. Yeah, no, I, I can, mm. yeah, I could hear his traditions in it. Mm. But I, I was intrigued to hear, but I'm sure I'm hearing um, some of what I recognize. And you talked a bit about the influence of Tobago. And as a non Trimbagonian, I am aware, I feel the difference between Trinidad and Tobago. At least when I listen, I can hear it. I, I, I can get the Tobagan, the Tobagonian accent clearly. <laughs> it's so almost like Jamaicans, and they probably think like us too. <laughs> Is and so I'm, I'm interested to hear when you talk about his use of the the folk forms. I don't like that term, but the jig and <laughs> and I'm wondering. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, because Tobago has taken such a, a very strong position on preserving and, and retaining the cultural forms um, of the colonial past and so on, um, and what has come out of that. The jig and reel, of course, has strong European roots, but that has been adapted, of course. Till today, we have things like Congo belly which is a fusion of Congo and Belly and so on. So you have a lot of fusions that are taking place even now. Um, but throughout it all, you can sense the, 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 the traditional rhythms of the tambourine band. And I must say the tambourine band is what is unique to Tobago, not the, the mm. tambourine per se. We've got the frame drums, we have several of those. But the tambourine band, is what is unique to Tobago, the way they play um, as three parts and all that. Um, so he, he, he had that as a kind of ground swell to how he created his music. Um, and, and you can see that in a lot of the songs. For me, I see the speech band patterns. Every time I listen to gossiping, Sukunya, Poverty is Hell, you can hear him going down that road, you know? So that, that that's how I, I get the connection there. Yeah, thank you. I'd like to open it up now to participants who might have any questions.
I don't see any questions in the Q&A. There's a long one. Not, well, no, not a question, sorry. That's a comment, I think. Yeah, that's a comment. Oh, no, he asks. I think, yeah. I, I, I think Mr. Shaq definitely hit the nail on the yeah. head there. Shaq also produces and arranges as a tool to translate his his musical vision. He had such a strong musical, um, a, such a strong musical identity. Yeah, um, I think I have a question um, in terms of space, right? So space came up in Martin's um, talk, also in John's talk. And I wonder about, you know, what does this space enable, especially in relation to, to texture and how does this space actually speak to ontology or to the ghostly matter and its relation to dreadness, right? How does, how does the created space within the music actually reckon with the rendering of jambiness? Um, the ghostliness and then um you know how that how that dreadness comes across sonically which i think also connects to yvonne and deborah's um paper so i think my question is how how can we actually think dreadness alongside this space and alongside repetition and the other kind of musical parameters um that that john brought up in his talk um Go ahead, Matt. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was reading Mr. Shack's question, so I think I was kind of paying attention to what he was asking. Sorry about that, Sharissa. Sorry about that. Yeah, so the question is just how can we think, you know, about this space alongside dreadness? Um, and how can we how can we actually reckon with that rendering of jumbiness and the ghostliness and the ghostly matter um, in terms of of the musical parameters that you brought to our attention in your analysis? Yeah, well, for me, every time I think about space, and this is just musically, um, I see if I can make the connection. Um, I was taught by a very good musician that you've got to use space, even in improvisation. There's, if you're not, if somebody's soloing, and they're just rattling it off. There's really no use in that. So the use of space, I think, gives everybody the opportunity to absorb, think, um, um, imbibe, um, you know, take what is being said. Um, I thought that the way Shadow, for example, on, on um, you're looking for horn. He starts always saying young fellow or young man, and then there's this long space. Ask for my opinion. And it's almost like when you hear it, the space gives you that, well, what is, what is he? And it gives you that opportunity to do that. Um, how you connect that, that, I have to give that some thought there. Yeah, and Dr. Francis asked, does it also open up space for the spirit to emerge and mingle? Which is a right. really, yeah, yes. Yeah. That's a good point. That's also a good point. I didn't see that. Yeah. Um, Doc, can, using, go ahead, go ahead. Eva. So you, you're using the break in time to make space. That's the fusing of space and time. So it's space as room, room that comes because he has the pause before they answer or before he goes on with the next note. No, I think, well, I'm giving my personal opinion. I think it's yeah, no, I'm, almost, just, I'm, I'm asking, yeah, I, I, yeah. I, 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 I'll just yeah. clarify yeah. that yeah, when we I, talk about space as though it's not um, place, but it's the kind of space you can get by a minute time in the in in the music you know not not the not time as in the rhythm but as in he's going to sing this and then there'll be no nothing vocal but there might be something instrumental till he answers the question you know young man you're looking for horn wait wait right wait. so yeah well I, the, the way i see it I thought when I look through all his songs, he uses these 
loud, I call them loud spaces, like a long, maybe sometimes two bars, sometimes four. And for me, those spaces are done purposefully. He wants to say something, even with that, because the rhythm is going, but the melody, is, he makes a statement and then there's space. So I can't accept what Dr. Francis has said there. Maybe that's a time for the, for the, um, the spirits to do their thing. Uh, but I thought musically, I think it's done purposefully as part of the way he delivers his music. I think it's done purposefully. Uh, Dr. Granger, um, can we answer Mr. Shack? Yes, do so. Yeah, so I think the, the story is a true story, by the way. Um, so Mr. Shack is making the point, how can a man who worked over five decades and had legitimate hits and must have worked with producers, right? And if a producer claimed to be responsible, how could that man, of course, be called stupid? Um, I think what Shadow was trying to say was, was really sad. Sad. He was trying to be sarcastic. I think what he was saying is that he is so different and so unique that nobody can claim to make him. So I think that's what he was really trying to say. He's so unique that, you know, no producer or anybody can say, I made Shadow. You understand? So he was very clear about what he wanted his sound to be, what he wanted the instruments to be, what he wanted the instruments to do. So I think when he said, well, boy, if, if, he, make, if he make Shadow, if he make me, then he should have made a lot more like me. So I think he was being sarcastic. Thank you for that. Uh, elaborate, Shadow. And with that, I'd like to end our first panel and thank all the speakers and pre presenters, um, as well as participants for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone for a very engaging discussion. Uh, the second panel will commence at 11, 10 past 11, so stay tuned. And we now invite uh, the technical team to share with us some videos. Oh, Mr. Marie's on. Okay, go ahead, Mr. Marie. Oh, no, 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 I, I realized I turned on my video in a second. I, I'm just I'm stepping away um, to teach and then I'll be back for this afternoon. I'll try to, to catch the end of this next panel and then I'll be on the course this afternoon. All right. Thank have you. A make -up. All right. Yes, Good yes. Luck. That, was, yes. That, was, that was splendid this morning. Yes, really, yes, really it splendid. was. Yes, it was, Rich. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. I, I, I learned a lot. <laughs> yes. Wow. For that, okay. for that, eh? For that. Uh, okay. All right, so, you'll take care. Uh, you, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for everything. Bye -bye. Okay. Here comes the shadow! So I was having a little story about shadow. <laughs> you know, somebody asked shadow, uh, the two shadow, the story goes that there was this arranger, producer, who said that he was responsible for shadow. And shadow laughed, you know, and he said, well, he had to be stupid, why he didn't make more shadow? <laughs> <laughs> you know, in where everything is nice and clean. A poor man living in a tinny winny hat, children hungry, nothing in the pot. He gone by the neighbor to beg for some rice. The neighbor under pressure, shadow.
always saw himself as Mr. Different. He was different. And he was adamant about what he wanted. Music in itself was a well-engineered piece of recording. So yeah. beautifully done. And uh, the strings and the voice, your voice meshed in so beautifully within that production. I mean, it made my heart feel so good. Yeah, well, it's a beautiful feeling. The first part of the feeling I would be playing my guitar and I feel the thing nice, you understand? So when I sit down with, um, it was like um, the same Thomas mm -hmm. and, um, and a guy named Neil, he was working with the um, computer. And we just walking and getting there, getting there. And another one, Andrew, just come in time and play a crazy piece of string. I say, well, yes, 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 yes. Don't move. You play that, right? I just play that and get out. And that was it. The whole thing about the, the, the dreadness of him had to do with that, that confidence he had in his unique ability to be so unique, right? I think that, that, I think that is a nice way to put it. That he had this confidence that he was unique and that nobody could move him away from that. She had me head in pain, me house like lover's lane, since she come down to Port of Spain. I come from work, I tired and hungry. A hearing in me bedroom, don't bite me. I bust the door like an ape. I see a man trying to escape. When they hear shadow come, the fella jump out and gone. Leave the rat is scrambling to hide the food he was eating. She trying to hide it quick. I snatch up a fat boomstick. It's only the rice she get to hide. I catch it with all the saltfish outside. Secondly, I think he, he understood the fact that shadow had a message from a place that was not where you came from or where you even visited um and that you needed to give him that respect all who condemning i am speaking to you keep on condemning till your time is due you better be careful don't come down in here I'll rip out your gizzard and put it in a coconut shell. I want to catch them, just say them, I'll drop them, jump it. Just jump it. No stopping. I want to wear them over with some clothes and have them jump it. So he had a style that was only his, right? And, and many times he complained even through the song. The judges could not read what, what he was doing. And, you know, he was saying that the university degrees can't judge what he is doing, right? He said that. <laughs> so I think on the music scene, everybody would know that he carved a niche that was unique. Are you feeling the feeling, baby? Let me hear you. When I say, are you feeling the feeling? You say, feeling the feeling. Are you feeling? He provided that other line of the approach to Calypso that, that would now cause us all to reflect, even at this point, we can all reflect and say, you know, that was Calypso, you know, going for that different kind of Calypso. I mean, others, they fall into the same kind of route. But if you hear a, a, a bass line in a certain way, immediately you say, no, that is shadow. If you hear the music, the strumming of the music, the first thing you say, no, that is shadow. Um, he had that. I mean, he was just, you didn't even want to hear him sing. You just needed to hear the music. Um, so I think in terms of his unique position in the Calypso uh, fraternity, I think it's our question. Are you feeling the feeling? Tell me. He had clearly uh, an obsession, I would say, <laughs> with with um, with hell. Um, he had an obsession, but I don't think it's hell in this sense. I think he saw it as a place to to pay back <laughs> or to to give judgment. Um, he had an obsession with zombies. Um, that could have come from the, the Tobago thing. The, the song was really, um, I, I, I used to write um, my music all the time from 
the threat on bleed he took me by out one day i remember uh, i told him um, he was shaving uh, i was trying to explain to him um, uh, i wanted to write these songs but uh, i have some different ideas he said well let me hear them Just the bass I wanted, I found out something else I wanted because they played it down, right? But um, I was missing something. Mm -hmm. I had the whole thing like... When, when, when put down the thing on the tape, I see. But this thing beating me here, man, I'm missing something bad, 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 bad. I couldn't move, you know, like I wanted. Then I, I was thinking, and I come up with the congas. Uh, the bass line was, was, was one of his big statements, right? Um, so that bass was always one that was memorable, but it was also one that breathed a lot. So it had a lot of space. The other thing I noted with his music, in terms of how he had to, was these heavy accents or accentuations in his music, punctuations also, um, so that to allow that, he understood the use of silence and the use of space. He used to use space both in terms of his lyrics and melody. So boy, yeah, in trouble. He mixed um, what I would call the great talk sing with singing. In Sukunia you hear it, in gossiping you hear it, in poverty in here is hell, you hear it where he's almost staying between some notes and he's really kinda preaching a sermon. The other thing I thought of what he was doing was, uh, as I spoke earlier about the punctuations, wap, cookie, bam, 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 wap. So he always had a way of doing that, pay the devil. Things he wanted to, he uses music and, and his words cleverly. He was also one of those doing scatting as part of his musical contribution. Scatting, he was scatting, I mean, all the time. You know? And that I thought, I mean, I was trying to listen to Kachina and Sparrow and some of the others to see if they were scatting all the time. Um, and I didn't get that. But I saw that in, in Shadow, he would scat all the time, you know. And I mean, it, it's almost like talking in tongues. But uh, it's a nice kind of thing, you know, he did that rhythmically. Well. Revelation, a good sensation. If you come out to party, you got to party harder. Don't let the music play. Look for a dancing space. If you come out to watch me, Watch me, life is a one way. 